Well, hello, Pot TV fans. Welcome to the Burning Shiva Hour. And uh, as it's now Crowley Mass, the, the birth date of Aleister Crowley, uh, the British magician who lived from 1875 to 1947, uh, we've got a special show on Crowley for you today. And our guest is Dr. Richard Kaczynski, one of the foremost Crowley historians uh, out there. And he, he's got some books on Crowley, like Perdurabo, uh, uh, The Life of Aleister Crowley, as well as some really fascinating books on the Secret Society, Order Templar, Orientis, like the Panic in Detroit and Lost Templars, Origins of the Templi Orientis. Uh, um, so I hope you find this interview, which will be mostly focused around drugs, since this is Pot TV and Crowley's uh, use of them and his magic and other, other ways. Uh, I hope you really enjoy the, the show. I've been an admirer of Aleister Crowley. I think that uh, I'm carrying on much of the work that uh, he started uh, over 100 years ago, and I think the 60s themselves. You know, Crowley said uh, um, he was in favor of, uh, of uh, finding your own self and, and uh, uh, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law under love. It was a very powerful statement. I'm sorry he isn't around now to appreciate the glories that he started. I am the snake that giveth knowledge and delight and bright glory, and stir the hearts of men with drunkenness. To worship me, take wine and strange drugs, whereof I will tell my prophet, and be drunk thereof. They shall not harm ye at all. It is a lie, this folly against self. Well, those are words that could have been spoken by the serpent in Eden, in fact, you know. And it's interesting because the man who wrote them, Aleister Crowley, in his pivotal book, central book, the, the Book of the Law, uh, um, is as controversial as drugs itself. And, and, the, and the relationship, you know, the warnings we received as youth about drugs and then finally trying them and going, hey, well, these aren't so bad after all, in some cases. <laughs> um, and, and the life of Aleister Crowley and Crowley's reputation in, in some ways have a parable there. Uh, a parallel there because often we you know I know myself I assumed all the worst satanic kind of identifications with Aleister Crowley uh, um, before I actually started to read his books and come to understand him and I first wrote about Crowley in my first book Green Gold the Tree of Life Marijuana and Magic and Religion back in the early 90s and then after that my next two books over the next couple of decades focus more on agent history. And I returned to Crowley again a little with my book, Libra 420. It actually started with a chapter about Crowley, which I ended up pulling due to space. Uh, um, and now I'm working on another book about Crowley. So it's been a, a long time interest to me. And I'm really happy to have here on Burning Shiva today, a person I would consider the foremost expert a biographical expert on the history of Aleister Crowley and the philosophy that developed around his teachings, Thelema, Richard Kaczynski. And I've read three of uh, Richard's four books. I think it's four books that, that he has. Uh, uh, his book on the life of Aleister Crowley, Per, per Durabo. Uh, his book on the OTO controversies in Detroit in the 1920s, Panic in Detroit and his book on the OTO, this being the Order Templar Orientis, a um, quasi-Masonic type group, I would say, uh, that uh, Crowley was the head of at some, one time, but was around before he had joined the Order. And this is his book on the origins of the Order Templar Orientis. Uh, um, and uh, Richard, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, thank you for inviting me on. Yeah, and so how long have you been studying Aleister Crowley for? Oh, since I was about 14 years old. Um, it's just been a lifelong interest of mine from both a, a, a personal standpoint and then um, as, I know, as, I, as more and more books began to be written about him, I came to realize that they were kind of, they're rather insufficient, they're inadequate, inaccurate, and uh, those kind of prompted me to kind of move from just someone who liked to read and study his works to actually writing about his life and his works. 
Hmm. What uh, got you onto it? Rock and roll or something like that? You see references in some rock and roll bands or something like oh, that? To Crowley himself? Yeah. Um, you know, it, was, it seemed to be kind of a strange function of the time I grew up in. And it just seemed that every place around me, there were references to the, the mysterious and the unknown. This is a time when the TV show In Search Of was, you know, being hosted by Leonard Nimoy of Star Trek fame. So kind of as a little sci-fi nerd, I had to watch that. And, um, you know, there were books on the occult, like at my other grocery store. Hmm. And, um, you know, with that all around me, that, that just was something I gravitated to. And it was for a process of, you know, kind of like I started with Nostradamus and ESP and very quickly moved to the Golden Dawn and then to the works of Aleister Crowley at Again, at the age of 14, I just went to my local occult bookshop and, you know, there oh, I wow. was. <laughs> and then you joined the uh, OTO yourself at some point, I guess. Yes, m uh, much, much later. Much like, later. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, obviously not when I was 14. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there you go, yeah. Uh, um, and tell people that don't know Aleister Crowley, maybe you could give a little brief kind of background on him. Sure. Um, Aleister Crowley was the son of a British family who, two, who has two features who I think are kind of relevant. One is that they were rich. Um, they had made, their family had made a fortune in railroads and brewing and he was kind of the, the scion of that family and um, had, had a certain amount of privilege because of that. And the other piece of it was that his his, particular, his parents had uh, converted from a Quaker faith that was kind of tradition for their, traditional for their family and became uh, members of the Plymouth Brethren, which is a much more fundamentalist sort of sect. And that very rigid um, and even almost puritanical um, sort of life made a great impression on him so that when he became old enough that he entered his majority and he got his fortune, he also was able to rebel against the religious upbringing that he had and that allowed him to get into all those things that were forbidden. Um, you know, drinking, smoking, poetry, and you know, the occult wound up falling into there somewhere as well. So, um, and from there, he discovered an organization called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Um, he had read in, in another book by uh, A. E. Waite, uh, the Book of Black Magic and Pacts, that there was an invisible college of initiates, and he was in search of that, and he believed he had found this with the Golden Dawn. And very, very he made connections with uh, like-minded people, uh, but it was at a time when that organization was falling apart for its own political uh, internal reasons, and so he went on on his own. And on his honeymoon, this is I, I guess will bring bring us to the quote that we opened with. Um, he he and his wife were in Egypt, and Crowley was demonstrating some some magic that he had done um, and had. Was, was studying, a kind of a, a showing off for his new wife. And uh, as a result of this sort of magical working, his wife Rose seemed to kind of enter a, uh, I don't know, a weird sort of state of consciousness that seemed, seemed to linger for, um, you know, after that, that evening. And she began saying that the, the, the Egyptian gods had a message for him. And eventually this, this, the, the, these things she was saying led Crowley to um, enter a, a room and sit at a desk at, 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 in the flat that they were renting and he was instructed to write down what he heard um, between noon and one o'clock on three successive days on April 9th, 8th, 9th, and 10th and that was the writing or the channeling um, or what have you of the Book of the Law which is the text that you quoted from and from there, Crowley de devoted his life to exploring its tenets and just exploring the practice of magic um, and you know, again, kind of devoted his whole life to that from that point onward and, and, and you know, getting its message out to the world. Hmm. Now, uh, some authors have suggested that the delivery of the book of its law itself may have involved drugs. There's no like written uh, documentation of that, but we do know Crowley sometimes left such things out uh, of his more written history, his personal, what he was publishing and stuff like that. Um, what do you think of that idea? Do you think that they could have been like using something like hashish or uh, Patrick Everett has suggested peyote, uh, uh, um, uh, being in Egypt and Crowley already having an interest in that sort of thing? 
You know, it's it's it's. I think that's one that's going to be impossible to say. To I mean, say if, if, if yeah. The idea is that he did, he left no record of it. And yeah. We can only speculate. Um, Crowley in his, in his diaries, however, does seem to be yep. fairly um, transparent mm-hmm. about his drug use. Yeah. And, and there are certainly instances of him, re- him you know, recording his own experiments um, in many places. So yeah. I, so like I, so it, I don't it, think he would have been cagey in, in those records, um, but he might have been a little bit more so in, you know, his memoirs for first. For, for yeah, example. yeah. Well, you know, there's the instance of Samadhi, I think, that which we've discussed before, where... Uh, um, he wrote quite clearly about his experience, having the experience of Samadhi. It wasn't until people started looking back in his diaries and seeing uh, uh, that he'd actually used hashish on the day he had his experience of Samadhi, you know, at the time period he's talking about. Uh, um, so that would have played a role there. But uh, it seems, uh, you know, in Sutton's book on Crowley, he goes over, you know, various notes and stuff like that. And it seems that Crowley was somewhat troubled that um, people would take his experience less seriously if they knew it was drug-induced. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, again, Crowley did write essays about these things and articles mm-hmm. and, and so on. He certainly had opinions. He lived at a time when wasn't le- illegal. It was, yeah, you could go down to your local pharmacist and and buy what you wanted. You know, I was, uh, you know, you know, laudanum was something that was widely used in Victoria. Absolutely, England yeah. At the time, for all sorts of ailments, and uh, so that was not at all uncommon. In fact, when Crowley, in his journal, The Equinox, published the, that that essay or a collection of essays on the herb dangerous, yeah, um, his his pharmacist E.P. Winneray, you know, contributed Real, one of those. Yeah, chapters. yeah. The first the first four issues of the Equinox all had a, 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 a essay on hashish in them, you know, like the split up, and then he did the translations. Uh, the translation of Baudelaire's work, and then Fitzhugh Ludlow's, uh, the American writer's uh, essay on, uh, or book on hashish, the hashish eater. He had an excerpt from that as well. So obviously was like something that was there for sure. Uh, um, and that's really what, you know, I think a lot of interest from the people that watch my show and follow what, what, I, what I write about and stuff like that uh, is, is particularly, you know, Crowley's use and interest in drugs. And we're living in a time right now where you know cannabis is being legalized uh, all over the world, been legalized here in Canada, and also there's this massive movement to push forward things like psilocybin mushrooms and other psychedelic substances uh, for medical purposes for treating PTSD and things like that. And this again area is a real central point uh, um, for that. And Crowley was really a pioneer in that. You know, we played that clip at the beginning of the show with Timothy Leary. Uh, um, talking about Crowley and, and suggesting his own work is a, a con- kind of continuation of that. What do you what do you think about that? I, I would I would agree that um, while certainly the, the use of of drugs for you know, entertainment purposes is certainly not new. Uh, the the idea that Crowley was using these for these the spiritual and the magical mm-hmm. uh, states of mind one could attain. Uh, was certainly kind of a novel thing. Um, you know, that may have been a, a behavior that we might have seen in, in shamans, but in terms of bringing drug use into you know, Western esotericism, that's, that was you know, pretty trailblazing stuff. Well, yeah, but there was stuff like uh, um, the Brotherhood of Luxor, uh, which you know, followed the work of Pascal Beverly Randolph, and they had like a sort of hashish initiation. Uh, in that, and Blavatsky herself was reputed to have uh, <clears throat> been a hashish eater by her lifelong friend Al Ross and, and other people, and even like guys like Levi, you know, he wrote a, about a cannabis infused wine in the same chapter. He had uh, his famous depiction of Baphomet <laughs> um, yeah. in, in that, you know. So there was some stuff around for yeah, sure. But in general, I mean, we don't we don't look at the Theosophists and think of them as potheads. Certainly you know? not. I, 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 I they tried to was... sue me. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. I don't. I'm not saying that either. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, no, we, but, we certainly don't. No. But uh, but yeah, but I think you know, you know Crowley kind of made his own experimentation a little bit more front and center. And I think the, Absolutely. the, the passage that you read, uh, you know, again, from the, from the book of the law, kind of exemplifies this idea that that is, that is an, an avenue you can pursue in this, in this system of magic. 
So who do you think initiated Crowley into uh, um, the use of these types of substances, and where did he kind of come into contact with it? Well, I think one of the obvious places to look would be his magical mentor and his roommate, Alan Bennett, who in the Golden, he was a Golden Dawn member, and he was referred to as the White Knight, uh, and very highly respected in, in the Golden Dawn community, but he had suffered from very severe asthma, and I uh, used a variety of drugs to deal with the symptoms of that condition, but he also noted the sort of psychotropic effects of these drugs as well. And you know, he is at least Crowley remembers him making some comment to him about uh, you know there's there are drugs out there that will open you know the, the windows to other worlds or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And while that doesn't necessarily mean that Alan Bennett was Crowley's first exposure to these substances, um, that, that's a logical first place to look, right. in particular in the context of using them for some sort of magical work. And Crowley's early diaries, in fact, do you know, refer to experiments with drugs at about the time that he was uh, roommates with Alan Bennett. Right, right. And there was like, you know, Yeats as well, uh, um, was experimenting with hashish and peyote, I think, even before. Yeah, but, yeah, but Yates and Crowley were not buds. Not, so. not buds, no. <laughs> uh, um, and certainly McGregor Mathers frowned upon the use of those types of substances from what I, I, I saw. But Westcott wrote about the, their, their use in initiatory societies and uh, uh, made reference to it. And you wrote about uh, another big influence on Crowley, uh, um, Yarker. Uh, uh, John Yarker, his right. experimentation uh, uh, with with cannabis. Yeah, yeah, there is a, a letter quoted uh, in a in, an article in uh, Ars Quattro Coronati, the a Masonic Research Lodge journal, uh, where Yarker is relating his experience using marijuana for the first time. And uh, I think you probably read that article more recently, so I can have uh, turned you on uh, yeah. uh, to that article. So um, Yeah, you turned me on to it for sure. But um, yeah, I mean, that's essentially he, was, he thought it was pretty cool. Well, it was interesting because he mentions the uh, Hindus attaining samadhi with it in the, in the reference, you know, and then Crowley later on, I think probably before he met Yarker, uh, it was when he had his experience with samadhi. I don't think it, that, was, that was all pre-OTO, I think, back in... Uh, Night. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, Crowley did not meet Yarker until about 1912, uh, when toward the end of the Equinox run. Yeah, and that was actually shortly before Yarker died, because he, he died uh, on the, the, equ the spring equinox, I believe, of 1913, if memory serves. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Crowley's time with Yarker was pretty short and is largely confined to, you know, correspondence, because um, they were not living in the same part of the UK at that time. Yeah, um, Yarker was living in, in Manchester, and Crowley was living in London at that time. Huh. So, so fortunately, their, their correspondence survives. So we, we have that. Yeah, back. and on Scottish rights, uh, a letterhead, I believe, wasn't it? The the, uh, the actual letterhead was on the agent and primitive. Uh, was on like the actual. Yeah, I, I would I would not necessarily say that the ancient primitive right was the Scottish right. That was it was okay. its own thing. But, right, but uh, yeah, there was. Hmm. Yeah, York, Yorker was the kind of the the last. The last, uh, I don't know, I don't, he he was the the international head of that organization at the time that that he died, and uh, when you know when he died, you know this, the the whole question of succession, both worldwide and in the UK, was something that Crowley, being part of that, you know, kind of brought into it toward the end, you know, involved himself in also. Well, that uh, organization's first North American chapter actually uh, uh, was started in this city. Uh, as you as you well know, oh, oh, oh. North, North Vancouver, Vancouver, yeah, North Vancouver, yeah. Um, and in the Registar, uh, you know, I read Martin Starr's book. I'm sure you've read it as well, The Unknown God, another excellent yes. uh, book. Uh, um, it has on the recommended li reading list for new students the psychology of hashish, and then they were recording experiments with peyote. In 1915, at the at the lodge on Lonsdale Avenue over here in North Vancouver, uh, um, that's pretty early psychedelic research, you know, even for Vancouver. Uh, um, right. What was the role of that? Like, you know, I know in this more probably a lot of people 
their experience and knowledge of the OTO is probably limited to Strange Angel and the popular uh, uh, TV series and sensationalized TV yeah, series. Yeah, which is more, far more fiction than fiction. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I like the first season a lot better than the second season, you know? Like, I just read Star's book, and I thought, oh, that's kind of not so bad, you know? Uh, but then, you know, when the second season, they have the astral traveling Crowley. Um, it was just a little too much of a jump of the shark for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly, again, it's uh, certainly more... more as I said, more fiction than fact. Yeah. But, um, yeah, but the uh, use of peyote uh, is, is interesting that you bring that up because uh, Crowley had encountered that uh, in his visits to Mexico when he was climbing mountains. Uh, you know, one thing that's not generally that well known about Crowley or, or appreciated is the fact that he was quite a mountaineer. And in his relatively short career of doing this, he had actually set a number of world records. Um, you know, in, you know, climbing at various ascents, stay, you know, living at a certain elevation. And some of the mountains that he climbed, you know, those records he had set were not broken for many, many years after he died. And he was in Mexico around 1900, climbing some mountains there. And it's around that time that he discovered, you know, peyote, or as he called it, you know, it referred to, like to refer to it by a scientific name, Anhelonium Luini. And, um, and part of the reason is that um, its initials, Anhelonium Luini, match liber al. Ah. Um, and so, and, and being being a Kabbalist and liking those sorts of word and number games, you know, that, that appealed to him. But Crowley did claim that he was the person who introduced that substance to Europe. Now, whether that is literally true or not is probably a subject of some debate. And, and, and again, historically, you might be better off, you know, in a better position to say whether uh, you know, there are evidence of that. Well, Francis King probably. makes the claim he turned on Aldous Huxley, but that doesn't seem so yeah, as but, likely. But, but be that as it may, I mean, again, as you point out, Crowley certainly was using this uh, Absolutely. pretty early on in the big scheme of things. And um, he, Crowley does mention in his visits in North America so later, in the around 1915, going to the Park Davis plant in Michigan and them actually making a preparation of, of peyote for him. And, you know, again, I don't know, we have a paper trail to document this, but it wouldn't surprise me in the least if that was the basis of the sorts of experiments you're referring to. Yeah, yeah, paper. well, that seemed to be going on. You write about in Panic of Detroit, uh, his uh, uh, prodigy, I guess, at the time, Magical Son, when they were friends, uh, Charles Stansfeld Jones, was also you know, uh, offering peyote over in uh, Detroit. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, that seemed to be like in part of like almost like the process of trying to draw people into uh, um, the OTO out of some of the other Masonic organizations that were going on there, you know. And, and also, wasn't Mexico, wasn't that where Crowley first kind of came into contact with that kind of Scottish rights type stuff? Or um, Yeah, when, when he was in Mexico, he did meet a fellow by the name of Don Jesus Medina Sidonia. Yeah. Um, who gave him the 33rd degree in some Masonic rite, and Crowley didn't quite, you know, as he tells it, he didn't quite buy it. He felt there was something kind of shady or, or fishy about it, but it nevertheless piqued his interest in, in masonry and that sort of, you know, secret society stuff. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that when he then, 12 years later, begins corresponding with John Yarker, um, you know, Yarker begins asking him things like, well, who, you know, who was it that gave you this degree? And, and what word were you given for that degree? And Yarker's saying, yeah, I know who this guy is, and, and you do have the right word. Therefore, I'm going to recognize you myself huh. as a, you know, a 33rd degree in, this, in the ancient and primitive right. And so it's on that basis that Yarker you know, issued a new charter to Crowley with, with his own signature on it. Huh. Interesting. And do you think there could be any connection there with his introduction to peyote, or he picked that up off of Indians over in Mexico? Um, again, that, that's an unknown. Um, Crowley doesn't say a whole lot about the experience, so I don't know that that was particularly, you know, hmm. that big a deal to him. I mean, he kind of mentions it more as a curiosity. Yeah. Um, so, well, un, so again, un, un, unknown. I don't think he says, to my, to, as I recall, I don't think he says how or where he discovered it. Mm -hmm. But he certainly took an interest in it, and, you know, uh, um one of the claims in the uh, um, secret rituals of the OTO uh, is that it was uh, 
used in the bitter cup that he's he that they, they say in that earlier book earlier laudanum would have been used in other substances i can't comment on that yeah okay okay, okay, yeah, okay. so we'll just kind of let that slide how about how these substances were used in magic by crowley like was that was it mirror scrying or was it uh, just like sitting there and writing stuff down or? well i think i think one of the most um detailed accounts that we have are some of the magical workings that he did with um, um, some of his uh, yeah, and kind of in conjunction with some of his magical sex partners yeah uh, particularly in the Abeldees working and the Amalantra working mm -hmm. uh, the Abeldees working was around 1912 and the Amalantra working was later that 1917 19, 1918 19, 19, 19. there's a great uh, April 20th account <laughs> on uh, where him and Stansfeld Jones eat hashish and uh, uh, I used it for the intro to my book Libra 420 because I released it on uh, 2018, April 20th, wow, sure. and so it was like a century, uh, century later. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, they, on April 20th, they they dosed up with hashish. Right, and, right. But but yeah, you know, I mean, in general, the his, his approach, you know, in those workings, seemed to be um, the 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 traditional line woman and song uh, approach, where um, you know he he and his partner would and get hammered on you know and, and and again it starts off you know with with alcohol and they have they have great sex and then his magical partner wound up in like some trance much like rose did in cairo with the book of the law and um and through this trance-like state Crow was able to carry on conversations with um you know Call it what you will, some astral entity, some greater human intelligence. And so it would be the woman speaking and then Crowley writing it down? Yeah, and then he'd be asking questions and, and she would be repeating um, you know, what, what she was hearing or being told by you know, the wizard Abeldees or Amalantra, depending on hmm. which person and which <laughs> working you're work, you know, talking about. But that seems to be where um, Crowley seems to put together this idea of... of of using ecstasy, now, not the drug ecstasy, but just yeah. you know the, the state of ecstasy, ecstasy, whether it be through alcohol or sex or what have you, um, as, as and a, sexual as, exhaustion, like taking the sex to the peak, yeah, and just so, kind of the the end point after an orgasm of blankness, right? So. Right. So we're kind of in that blissed out zone, and then able to uh, connect to things, and um, so that that seems to be where you know he starts to put those pieces together that this this stuff can help, you know, uh, you know, reach those states of consciousness. Hmm. Interesting. Well, let me just, this is like uh, um, page one, two, three of probably, I would say, this is Crowley's most famous book, The Book of Thoth. Uh, um, I, I would, I guess, in the bestseller. It's uh, certainly a popular one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, most accessible, you know, probably the yeah. one that people use well, the most. It's, it's because it's, it goes with, this tarot with the tarot deck, and stuff, right? Very, very popular. And he has this essay here, De Herba Sanctissima Arabica, <laughs> which means the most holy grass of the Arabs. Although, although that is actually from... Uh, Liber Alif. From, yeah, yeah from, Liber Alif, yeah. Uh, um, and he proceeds it with this uh, uh, thing, uh, um, I cry aloud my word as it was given unto to man by mine uncle, Alco Frabius Nassier, the oracle of the bottle of back book, and this word is trink. You know anything about that? Um, I not off the top of my head. I would have to. Uh, uh, this is like uh, rearranged. Is Francois Alcofabius Nassier is Francois Rabelais? Ah, okay, yeah. yeah. And um, the word trink is the from the holy bottle of Rabelais. Uh, um, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the book of uh, Gargantua and Pantagruel, I'm sure you're familiar with, right, right. there's the, the famous Grail myth, kind of like a parody of the Grail myth, where the guy, uh, Panurge is worried about becoming a cuckold, and he, if he gets married, so they seek out the Oracle of the Holy Bottle. And the Oracle of the Holy Bottle, when he gets it, produces this word, trink, which has been ascribed a lot of mystical significance by various authors, including, including Crowley. Uh, um, and then he uses it to proceed this essay, De Herba Sanctissima Arabica, the most holy grass of the Arabs. Uh, um, now, Trink, in his like uh, um, diary notes from 1923 in Tunisia, uh, he's, he, he makes it clear that he, this is an omnipotent potion uh, producing ecstasy. And elsewhere, 
he refers to having uh, taken ether uh, as uh, uh, seeking advice from the oracle of the bottle of the holy bottle, which is like the same thing. Uh, um, so it seems like he's making a connection here, right up to this essay, De Herbo Sanctissima Arabica, uh, um, the most holy grass of the Arabs, which is all about hashish. Recall, O my son, the fable of the Hebrews, which they brought from the city Babylon, how Nebuchadnezzar, the great king, being afflicted in his spirit, did depart from among men for seven years' space, eating grass as doth an ox. Now this ox is the letter Aleph, and that Atu of Thoth, whose number is zero, and whose name is Maat, truth, or Maut, the vulture, the all-mother, being an image of Our Lady Nuit, but also it is called the fool, who is Parseval, Darain Tor, and so referreth to him that walketh in this way of the Tao. You know, it's funny, when I first read it, I read it in Liber Alif, and I had this crazy experience, you know. You know, I, I'm sure like you've, uh, uh, um, you've you know, the, 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 the Lon, Lon Milo Duquette famously at his essays always asks, I mean, not his essays, his lectures, always asks, is, uh, is there any reincarnations of Aleister Crowley? Because it's such a common thing. Now, these guys were really into building their astral double. You know, like they'd spend hours, as you know, Crowley and Stansfeld Jones was a big part of what they were doing. Do you think that these guys could survive in like any sort of astral double form after after death? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think the, the the physical body is part of what sustains that astral yeah. form, and and I think the, the 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 that astral body of light is something generally that's different from um, you know the actual soul stuff that you're generally talking about, spoken about. Um, yeah, when you mentioned the, uh, the, the people who claim to be reincarnations of Crowley, it's kind of funny because one of Crowley's Things is friends and followers, yep. uh, Gerald York, uh, after Crowley died, referred to this concept in, in the form of Buddhism that he was familiar with, saying that certain ascended masters, that when, when they die, their souls don't come back as a discrete you know, package, but that it actually kind of breaks up and then pieces of that soul wind up in a bunch of separate people or kind of kind of like this they be planting the seeds for future enlightenment of another hmm. generation and a bunch of different people right and so yeah i'm not i'm not saying Cro that all these reincarnations of crowley really are reincarnations of crowley but yeah 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 know, the, 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 the well crowley himself he claimed a long line of reincarnation yeah yeah but, but yeah yeah york kind of puts out that idea that you know crowley's essence may well have wound up in you know multiple people so yeah, I think it's more like the ideas and stuff kind of blend into it and stuff, you know? It's like, uh, um, it, it's, it's uh, that's that's the reincarnation, kind of what like Leary was saying, the, the program, you know what I mean? That, yeah, yeah, well, you know, are you, yeah, I mean, we could kind of go on and, you know, ponder, are you actually remembering a past life or are you somehow tapping into the Akashic record and kind of... I'm always like, suspect you know, of the play, past play life thing, state, yeah, like, yeah. Like, you know, like in the Matrix, so I know Kung Fu. Yeah. yeah, 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 no, for sure. Imagination is such a tricky thing and that's really where the magical faculty lays is with imagination, you know. Uh, um, and so that's, I think, probably a big part of also why drugs are often involved in it. Um, now, Crowley also struggled with uh, addiction in his life, and uh, um, it seemed like, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about uh, um, that he was like, you know, like a heroin, he was a heroin addict, but he'd come to it through other medical kind of necessities. Yes, yes. Oh, in fact, I'm very glad you brought that up, because that, that seemed to be a very common misconception. You get this idea that, you know, Crowley was this lifelong heroin addict, and by the time, you know, he, he was at the end of his life, he was taking enough heroin to kill a room full of people. Uh, that actually, was, that's a statement uh, famously made by uh, his first biographer, John Simons. The, the fact of the matter is that Crowley, um, and, and this seems to be a, a common result um, or a common thing that happens to mountain climbers, but apparently being at those high altitudes takes its toll on the lungs. And this seemed to be the case for Crowley, at least. Mm -hmm. um, and he had developed asthma and was seeing a doctor um, on, on Harley Street in London, a very, a very well-established and well-respected physician. And this was after he had returned to 
the UK from his time in uh, the United States. So this is about 1919. He's, you know, Crowley was born in 75, so that would make him, what, 44 um, years old at this time. And for his asthma, his, his physician, you know, it prescribed to him uh, heroin because heroin has an analgesic property and helped open up the lungs. The problem that winds up happening is in 1920, the Dangerous Drugs Act is passed in the UK and drugs like heroin and opium and so on are, are now contraband. And that also happened to be the time that Crowley moved to, you know, Chafalu, Italy and started as Abbey of Thalema and he was you know, able to acquire drugs while he was there, but you know, after a couple of years, two, three years, he um, he's, he's just broke, and he, yep. he can't destitute, and he can't afford this. And there's actually a letter, and, he, and again, this is one of these reading between the lines things. Yeah. Um, but he talks about how he was really sick, and his legs just started kicking, and he broke, you know, the bed stand up, you know. Uh, and you know, you read the descriptions of what addiction's like and what kicking the habit is yeah. like, and it's like, there, there's Crowley going cold turkey. You know, he, he ran out of money and he couldn't maintain the habit. So hmm. you're talking about this period from about 1919 to about 1924, maybe 23, 24, uh, where he was um, taking heroin, but again, initially for medicinal reasons. Yeah, and there's no record of him taking that again until much later in his life, in the mid, or, you know, early to mid 1940s, hmm. um, when again, his, he's, he's getting older and his asthma is really, really bad. And um, by that point, the medical establishment in the UK had evolved to a point where heroin was allowed to be dispensed again, but in very, very controlled right. quantities. And there, again, there's an, there's an entry in Crowley's diary for the very first time he takes that first dose of heroin, and he talks about how he's quite loopy. <clears throat> but and from that point to the end of his life, he was taking this drug, and, and, and again, very controlled dosages sent out by his doctor to manage his heroin. Um, there were there were other medicines out there he'd been taking in the meantime. It's just they he had his it had become so severe that um, it wasn't controlling his symptoms anymore. So at least as far as heroin goes, we're talking to really small periods of his life and, and it was for medical reasons so you know this this myth of him being the you know lifelong heroin addict is you know one of the many exaggerations that we find about Crowley. How about the story uh, that his doctor wouldn't give him heroin and when he was on his deathbed and he, he you know like uh like put some curse on him for not uh, anything to that. Yeah, it's nonsense. I mean yeah. he, he had he had heroin until the day he died. He was he was getting it you know in the mail you know um hmm. You know, pe again, people like to make up stories about Crowley. This doctor who died shortly after Crowley died was an old man, and and you know we we could sit back now and say, hmm, everyone that Crowley has ever known is now dead. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and, and so obviously he cursed them all. Well, yeah. it's just people get old and die. You know, yeah. it's, it doesn't mean anything. You know? Absolutely. And what about uh, cocaine? He wrote a paper on cocaine. Uh, what was his relationship with that? Yeah, he was um, during during the Chafalu period. He was he was he, he had his troubles with cocaine, and that uh, he actually went through a around the same time he wrote Diary of a Drug Fiend. He went through a period of trying to stop cocaine and and had and heroin, um, and just had a really really hard time. And I and I, and I think if you read the text of this this experiment, he called it Liber Nike. Um, it kind of shows that while he had this this you know, metaphysical idea about drugs that, um, you know, if you are, if you're taking the drugs, but you are always doing them under will, you know, toward, toward the, the purpose of your place here on, on earth, that, you know, they would not harm you, that you, that you would be free from addiction because you're, you're not going to be susceptible to the, the sort, same sorts of impulsivity or impulsive use or ab abuse that you might if you're just taking drugs recreationally. But if you're always doing it for a great, for a spiritual goal, you'd be protected. Well, you know, he was hooked and, you know, and his journal show that was much harder to, to get, get it under yeah. control. A real struggle of will, which was his big thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, I thought he had a really good point on plant medicines versus chemical extracts in that he reprints in the Book of Thoth. I don't know if it was printed anywhere else. 
Uh, one of the great differences between agent and modern chemistry is the idea of the alchemist, that substance in its natural state is, in some way or other, a living thing. The modern tendency is to insist on the measurable. One can go into a museum and see rows of glass globes and bottles which contain the chemical substances which go up to make the human body, but the collection is very far from being a man. Still less does it explain the difference between Lord Tom Noddy and Bill Sykes. 19th century chemists were at great pains to analyze opium and isolate its alkaloids, rather like a child pulling a watch to pieces to see what makes it go. They succeeded, but the results were not altogether wholesome. Morphine has much more direct hypnotic effect than opium. Its action is speedier and more violent, but it is also a very dangerous drug, and its effects are often disastrous. The action of morphine is sensibly modified by the other 20-odd alkaloids which exist in opium. The intoxicating effect of alcohol differs according to whether one absorbs it in rich borg 29 or in synthetic gin. An even more startling example comes from Venezuela where running messengers chew coca leaves, cover their 100 miles a day, and sleep till they are arrested. They have no bad reaction and they do not acquire the habit. Cocaine is a different story. The adepts of the tarot would say quite simply, we are alive when the plant is alive so we can make friends. If you kill the plant first, you are asking for trouble. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's you know probably some some wise wisdom we could all uh, learn. A big difference between chewing coca leaf and uh, snorting cocaine, as Curly himself found out. Yeah, um, well, I think yeah, part of um, <clears throat> you know one of the other things I think that gets lost in the Abbey of Thelema story, where which is where Curly did a lot of that experimentation with his drugs, um, particularly the cocaine. Um, but you know, there are stories that he just he had this stuff in a drawer somewhere that was readily accessible, and part of that I think was this idea that um, you know it's kind of like we we're talking about you know don't put you put your finger in the electrical socket. There you know one of my favorite lines in The Simpsons is this scene where um, Bart and Ralph go looking in you know Ralph's dad's closet. Ralph's dad is the chief of police. And they get caught looking in his closet, and the dad comes in and says, "Why are you kids so interested in the forbidden closet of mystery?" <laughs> and, and I just love it, and, and, and I think that's that was kind of Crowley's approach with weaving these drugs around. It's just, yeah. you know, these, these things are illegal. There's a lot of mystery around them, and there's a fascination. And just by having them laying around like they were, they were just here all the time, freely available, was not so much a here go go crazy, but it was just kind of like, yeah, it's no big deal. And just trying try, just trying to normalize that, and and you know some of these controversial uh, murals, you know, very sexually explicit murals and things that he painted. I think were kind of the same thing to kind mm -hmm. of deprogram all of these 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 taboos and hot buttons that we have around drugs and sexuality and these sorts of things, and just kind of make them part of you know just just make them normal and not, yeah. not have that kind of power over you well he was one of the few people sensibly arguing against drug prohibition as it was taking place you know like he, he made it pretty clear that he didn't didn't think that was the route to take um now his relationship with stansfeld jones is you know obviously a point of interest for me they had that the, their major falling out it seems like that was all over a misunderstanding about a case of books or you think there's a lot more to it than that um, no, I think it was about a case of books, from what I can tell. Um, and that's described in some detail in Panic in Detroit, where um, Crowley, after, after he left the United States, um, he had left Charles Stansfield Jones managing, um, right, he was a bookkeeper for right. this bookstore that had published the, or was carrying, distributing the Blue Equinox that he had published in Detroit. And Crowley shipped over Two, two cases of rare books um, for, for and, 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 and Jones kind of took custody of these when Crowley left and uh, put them in a warehouse because um, the, the bookstore was folding and having some financial troubles. And before, every, you know, before the shit hit the fan, as it were, uh, Jones and um, Wilfred Talbot Smith, I believe, was with them at the time. They moved to moved to Chicago and they set up their own publishing company there and when they went back to Detroit to get these cases out of the warehouse they could only find one of them hmm. and Crowley just came to believe that Jones had sold off those books and had pocketed the money and ripped them off essentially 
Um, I think part of that was there was some negotiation between them because Jones, again, was, was warehousing these things. He had out-of-pocket expenses. Yeah. Crowley had shipped some other books to him and he had to pay the duty on them and all of this. And Jones is like, you know, hey, you know, I'm happy to do this for you, but you know, I've, I need my expenses covered. And Crowley didn't seem to appreciate that. So when this one case of rare, rare books goes, yeah. up, goes missing, Crowley's like, yeah, you know, you sold them. I know you did, and, and he didn't. But uh, since they, no one could find them, Crowley jumped to this conclusion, and things were never quite the same. There were, there were a couple of moments of, you know, rapprochement where, they, you know, he, he tried to reach out, but it just it never quite, yeah. it, it, huh. it never quite got past that. Huh. You know, uh, um, I, I went through some of the, the letters in 48 that uh, Stansfeld Jones was exchanging with various people, and it seemed to me like he was like claiming that he was the head of the North American ODO still, because uh, he had been uh, uh, um, uh, ordained as such by Rice, uh, um, and uh, Crowley, he said, had not been. You know, what, 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 anything to that? Um, it doesn't really matter because yeah, it's yeah. Crowley's um, OTO, well, really. And I, and I believe there, there are letters where Jones also, you know, abdicates that role, and I think there's points where Crowley, you know, also, uh, you know, fires him essentially. Yeah. Um, and and Jones had gone on to other things. You know, he he was you know, into his A N F Mott business. He was. A Maha Guru of the Universal Brotherhood. I mean, he, he just he really had nothing much to do with Crowley after they were falling out. So um, and and you know the way the way this worked was that um, Royce had chartered Crowley as a Grand Master yeah. of OTO in the UK. Yeah. But then he that he, that he also extended to Crowley jurisdiction over other English speaking countries. Right. So Crowley was able to appoint Grand Masters in. You know the U.S. and Canada and South America, or some South Africa, rather, and and in Australia, and and that was you know, on his own recognizance. And you know, regardless of whether Theodore Royce had appointed him or not, Theodore Royce died in the early 1920s, and Crowley succeeded him as the head of the order. So if Crowley wanted Jones out; he didn't need Royce's permission to. Yeah. You know. Well, it's Crowley's OTO, really. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like it, it wasn't really the same thing before that, and it's its own kind of thing. In Panic in Detroit, you know, you quote a lot of these news stories and there seems to have been uh, a lot of uh, interest in, say, the, the use of uh, hashish and other substances in the press by these guys. There's one story where they talk about Crowley controlling people's mind with the influence of hashish. And it also seems, uh, um, when you take a look at, uh, you know, the happenings uh, in California with uh, with Talbot Smith, who, of course, is Alfred in the Strange Angel TV series, right. uh, um, that there was uh, stuff happening there with, with, with psychoactive substances and stuff like that. That all seems to have, like, fallen by the wayside uh, um, from what I can see as an outsider of, of the modern o OTO. Was there a point where that just like, you know, uh, what, what, what's the cause of that? Was there some controversy about drugs or the, just the illegality made it uh, too much of a heat score for to be using it? Or what's the deal with that? Well, I, I, a couple of comments I would make. One is that any, any of the articles about uh, Detroit, I would take with many, many grains of salt. Because yeah. Because clearly there, there was this moral panic and people were making claims about all kinds of things. That Absolutely. But at the same the time, way. we see psychology of hashish on the reading list for new students over at the OT Lodge in North Vancouver and recorded right. well, experiments I'm, I'm, I'm with peyote. I'm referring to this, this Detroit period. I mean, you know, again... The, well, he was the, given the peyote in, the, in your book in Detroit. Yes, yes. But the point is that you know, there's this talk about there's this OT love cult going yeah. on in Detroit. And, and, and in fact, nothing was ever started or founded and yeah. so that you know again much of what's in those those newspaper articles is just false and, right right and so i wouldn't uh put a whole lot of weight into any of that but as far as um you know the modern day oto goes uh and 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 how this ties into crowley's past with uh entheogens i would say that you know the the oto's job really is to you know and if you go through its foundational documents it is to perform the initiation ceremonies. And those initiation ceremonies contain instructions on how people should live their lives. They're, they're kind of moral, you know, they're, they're mystery plays with lessons to them. And, you know, the organization, you know, OTO does not take any 
I don't know, we, we, it doesn't take, you know, it doesn't concern itself with what practices, magical or otherwise, people might engage in their personal, private magical practice. Um, and so it's, it's not like, you know, the, the, the main thing that OKO is concerned about is that, um, you know, in, at least in, in, in the United States, I can use that as an example, is it is incorporated as a 401c nonprofit organization. And, um, you know, for, for the purposes of being able to exist and function and operate that, you know, you need to obey the laws of the country you're living in. And, hmm. it, and, and it's because of that, you know, it, the, the organization's always had a very strict rule about not consuming drugs on the, for premises. Always because, where, like, or, in or, Secret or, Rituals or, of the OTO, they talk about... Well, again, account. I can't comment about yeah. OTO so, secret and, rituals. And, They're called and, secret for and, a reason. And, you know, Crowley <laughs> himself says to, in a letter to Mudd, uh, um, Pantagruelian, always a necessity for the Abbey. And this is a reference to Thelema and the Abbey, and Pantagruelian is a direct reference to cannabis that Crowley would have been familiar with. Uh, um, but you were asking me about modern day. Oh, modern day. Uh, no, I'm, I'm saying was there a split though too? I realize that's the, the situation with modern day OTO, and I think there was like some controversy with the Solar Lodge and other things. Uh, that, and the Solar Lodge is not OTO either. So. No, but like, the, uh, wasn't there wasn't there some sort of a, a drug bust with some members of the o, one of the OTO lodges at one point? There, there, there was a. I, you know, that that's one that I don't recall the details of. There was there was a raid of a of a space in in California, and that and and, and again I don't recall those details offhand. That may be the basis of why you know the, the very strict rules. There was happened, a, there was an exclaimed rule after there, that. There was, yeah. there was a a you know it's not a, a, at that time and still even today it's not unusual that OTO would would operate in people's private homes, and and then then there become that issue of. You know what people's personal property is on the premises where these official meetings were happening, and and so they're, they're, you know the policy just kind of required it needs to be a hard barrier. You know that 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 if you're if we're having meetings in somebody's private home, there can't be drugs on the premises. You know because that jeopardizes the OTO's legal existence. You know if it's breaking the law. So, so it's like but, do as thou wilt as long as it's not illegal. <laughs> well, it's, not, it's it's you know even Green Crowley's time he would acknowledge that you have to obey the laws of the land in which you live. He was breaking and, them. Hmm? He was breaking them. <laughs> you know, I'd say like even well, even in like uh, the, the the time period that uh, uh, the unknown God uh, is taking place with Tablet Smith and those guys, there was clearly law breaking happening going on. Oh, Crowley there. was not there. No, he but but it was in OTO. England. It was OTO, and you know we have the situation where Moto turns and. Uh, well, yeah, but you know, you're talking about you know uh, uh, what what people are doing in, in their private home as part of their own, you know. I mean, the 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 place where OTO was happening was Jack Parsons' mansion in Orange Avenue, and to, you know, and Jack Parsons was you know kind of a, a rebel anyway. He was definitely so to, writing about so drugs to say, too. So to so, say yeah. you know to say that was OTO, I think is a little unfair. Too, because these are people who are kind of doing their own thing. Well, you know, I know you can't talk about it, but secret rituals of the OTO—that's OTO. You know, and, I and I don't know what yeah, to say, or you're, yeah, I don't know where you're trying to take. This well, story. no, I'm, I'm just wondering about the bitter cup in, in the in the original but one. I told you I can't talk about. I it. know, I realize, but you're making it. We, we, we do talk about it in the sense like that it doesn't exist when you when you kind of go into well, I, it. I, it's it's not part of OTO's today current practice and that, current, yeah. that reference that you're referring to. I can say is about a ritual that was written in 1913. Huh. Um, so whether you know how how those things played out, you know. Historically, beyond that, you know, is is another question entirely. Cool. Why well, didn't mean to upset you? Oh no, no, no. It's like, it's, it's, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. No, I realize. That, um, I like, I, and I want you to know that I have like you know intense respect for your work and the history that you've laid out, and I consider you to be you know the foremost authority on it. Um, at the same time, I think that substances like peyote and cannabis were a big part of the intention behind what Crowley was doing, uh, even with the OTO. Uh, um, so I, I just kind of feel like it's like, you know, 
I see this happen in a lot of the history of religion where there's, you know, maybe some sort of like forming formation period where some sort of psychoactive shamanic uh, substance is taking place, say like Soma and the Vedas or something like And then it goes out, you know, and then it yeah. kind of changes it. Well, I think, you know, I think the point I was trying to make a little bit earlier um, is that while an or, as an organization, OTO, you know, has to abide by the laws of, of the country in which it's operating, um, it's not in the business of telling people what they should or shouldn't be doing in their private practice. And so the, to the people who want to pursue that as part of their private, you know, magical work, there's nothing preventing them from doing that. Um, well, it's been a, a very educational uh, uh, interview. I, I picked up a lot of... Uh, new knowledge on it and uh, I'm fascinated. I'm interested to see how Crowley's uh, becoming more popular in mainstream culture. Uh, yeah. uh, um, it, it's, it's really taking place and uh, I think the, uh, the real story has yet to be told and I hope that things like Strange Angel and their sensationalism uh, lead to uh, uh, something better, you know, like a really serious documentary on Crowley because I think that story is yet to be told. Well, yeah, yeah, and, I, and, and you know, for whatever, you know, misgivings, as we discussed earlier, we may have about the historical accuracy of something like Strange Angel. I mean, it's, it's certainly compelling drama and it's bringing, you know, it's bringing attention to this figure and, and just the whole idea of philanthropic philosophy. So who knows where that might lead. Okay, well, it's been a pleasure, Richard. Thanks for coming on the show. Yes. Thank you. Hey, Luce, as thou will. Well, that was a fun interview, and I learned a lot. Um, uh, if you want to check out Richard's work, there's a link to his website down below in the description, as uh, well as where you can purchase his books. Um, also included, I've offsetted some of the things in the interview. I didn't want to interrupt uh, Richard too much with my ideas on some of this stuff, because it was an interview after all. Uh, but I've included links to a couple of articles I've written about Crowley and drugs and the OTO and drugs, as well as the works of Patrick Everett, a Irish OTO member who's written extensively about Crowley's use of peyote. So thanks again and happy Crowley Mass. <laughs>